And so today we're looking at um, chapter 2, verse 6. It's bolded and there's an underlined word there. So I just want to draw your attention to that, where it says, Likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Now, um, just want to give you a brief uh, overview of the context. Here, um, I've listed out all of the, the various categories within the life of the church, the older men, the, younger, the older women, the younger women. And you see there, in the first place, that the focus in chapter 2, it shifts from the leaders in chapter 1. Paul's uh, assignment to Titus was to raise leaders, and now he's shifting now to the congregation and with specific instructions for various groups in the church. So in the first place, you see that older men are to be sober-minded. Their discipline of life brings a clarity of mind. They're to be dignified. Uh, They are honorable and respectable with clear godly values. In the third place, they are self-controlled, which we'll look at this morning for younger men. And that just simply means that their inside values control their outside behavior. Uh, Number four, they are sound in faith and love and in steadfastness. They are spiritually healthy and stable. And so finally, we saw that older men in the body of Christ are to be a model of what it means to faithfully walk in God's grace with God's people in a fallen world. Older men in the body of Christ are to be a model of what it means to faithfully walk in God's grace with God's people in a fallen world. And in the second place, we saw older women, what older women are to be. And we, we heard last week that older women are to be reverent in their behavior. In other words, their holy living is appropriate for someone set apart for God's serv- as God's servant. They are not to be slanderers. Uh, their speech is characterized by grace and humility. They're not slaves to much wine. They are not overpowered by something that numbs their life in God. Uh, they're good teaching people. They model God's grace to God's people in a fallen world. And they're trainers of young women. They're committed to passing on their wisdom to younger women. And so we said that older women in the body of Christ have a strategic role, a strategic role in helping younger women to navigate the challenges of personal and family life in a fallen world. And now, just give me, give me a couple of seconds here to just flatter the younger women in our church. In fact, the Bible, when it talks about younger women, it means anybody who's 60 and under. So, you know, there you go. You're welcome. Uh, the Bible really looks at you, and, and it says that, that you are a young woman. And where do I get this from? First Timothy 5, in First Timothy 5, it says that women who are under 60 years old should be taken off the list for care. Why? Because women who are 60, year old, 60 years old are young. Um, it, you know, implied in that text is that women who are 60 and older uh, don't necessarily have the means or the ability to take care of themselves. And so, uh, in society, we'd look at those women as older women. And so, you're welcome. To be young is to be 60 and under. And so, younger women, and that applies to 80%, 90% of you this morning, are to be faithful to their own husbands and children. They care and show fondness for their families. In the second place, there's to be self-controlled. This is a command that's also given to the older men and implied for older women, right? When it says they should not not drink too much wine. We're talking about a a type of control here. And so women are to be self-controlled. Their inside values uh, control their outside behavior. They're to be pure. They have discernment to not get mixed up in what is harmful to their spiritual health. They're to be working at home. That means they're just put in the hard work of maintaining a healthy home and family. And they're kind. They are not harsh. And finally, they're submissive to their own husbands. Their marriage union, and we're talking about marriage here. We're not talking about in general, relationships in general. Um, This is not the way that Christ intended his church to be, where where, uh, an unmarried woman has to submit to an an unmarried man. This is not the case. In fact, in uh, the, the, the passage that's often quoted where we see that a woman should submit to her husband is Ephesians 5. But you know what Ephesians 5.21 says? Submit to one another in love, both male and female. And so one of the calls for women is to submit, one of the special calls for women is to submit to their own husbands. But in general, we should be submitting to one another in love. We should be caring for one another in those ways, serving one another. And so we saw that younger women in the body of Christ have a unique opportunity to gain from the wisdom of older women in order to navigate the challenges of personal and family life in a fallen world. Uh, What are the benefits of that? The benefits of younger women 
having these, this great opportunity to learn from the wisdom of older women. Okay, so now we're going to dive into the text. So if you're a younger man, which is 60 and under, that's what we're talking about here. That's the range. That's 90% of you again. This text is for you. Now, it's also for you if you're not a man because self-control is an issue of character. It's an issue of, of how you're being molded, how you're being grown, and how you're being developed in, in the life of Christ. Uh, God wants for himself a self-controlled people, and so this applies for Christians in general. But we're going to focus in particular for younger men. Now, women, if you're hearing this, you should be saying amen because this is going to help you reinforce what you're teaching your children, perhaps if they're men. Uh, perhaps, le- perhaps less so if you're trying to teach your husband. Uh, but we see that young men have a specific, a special call in this text, and it's a very important call, and we'll see why. I want us to observe one main thing about this text, one major observation. One major observation is the men are given one task. Focus. Focus here. They're given one task to be self-controlled. Do you see that in the text? Just Titus urged the young men to be self-controlled. I have nothing else to say. Just, I mean, you notice older Older men, and even before that, elders are given lists. Uh, Older men are given lists, and older women are given uh, another list, and then younger women are given an even longer list. And then younger men are just, Paul just looks at them and he says, I don't know what to do with young men. Just tell them to be self-controlled. So we get one task, young men. We get one task, self-control. This theme of self-control is actually central, if you've noticed it in the reading of the text. How many times does he say self-control? And, I've, and there you see in the text that I've underlined it. In verse 2, he says self-controlled. Titus chapter 2, there in your outline. It's underlined, self-controlled. And there in chapter uh, 4, uh, excuse me, in verse 4, you see that word or that phrase, so train the young women. It's actually a derivative of the, of the, of the word self-control. Uh, that word is, in, in other words, teach them or train them to be sober-minded. It's implied in that verb. And then in verse 5, you see there, again, to be self-controlled, teaching women to be self-controlled. So by, that by the time we get to Titus chapter 2, verse 6, it's already been said five times, and it'll be said one more time in chapter 2, verse 12, where Paul says that God has shown us his grace so that we can live self-controlled lives. So already in Titus, it's six times. In the pastoral epistles, in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, in total, it's, it's seen 10 times, this word. And so, and you have the references there. Uh, you have to understand that by the time Paul is speaking to young men, the word self-control has been compounded. It's increased. The intensity has gotten so heavy that by the time a young man hears self-control, he should be thinking, I can't handle that. This is intense. And so he just looks at the young men and says, I have no lists, just one word, self-control. Please, self-control. All of your problems will go away if you just be self-controlled, it seems. Apparently, self-control is more than enough for a young man to handle, apparently. Otherwise, we would see lists here. Now, before we go on any further, I'm saying the word self-controlled, and I'm assuming that you understand what that means. I'm assuming that we all agree on what the definition is. But I want to define self-control because we live and breathe on definitions. Uh, There's not too much debate about what the word means itself in the Bible. Um, the, The translations differ a bit. The King James Version, if you're reading the King James Version, it translates that term as sober-minded. So now we're talking about the mind. What are we controlling in particular? The mind. And that's a good translation because um, the word, the root word, is actually the w- root word for mind. That's what it, what it means. And then the New American Standard Bible, if you're reading that version, translates it as sensible, which is another good definition because, or a good word, because to be sensible is to have a sort of thoughtfulness about you, to, to be able to uh, kind of be self-mastered in, in, a, in many ways. And so we could define it 
as literally safe-minded, somebody who has a safe mind. Uh, you know, you look around and you can kind of see, okay, this person has a safe mind to them. They're kind of self-controlled. They, they're sensible. They're thoughtful. They're thinking rightly. But now, um, let's define a little bit more. Let's give it a little bit more nuance here. So we want, it to, we want to see it as generally the ability to be self-mastered, the ability to be self-mastered, self-controlled, sober-minded, and balanced, a balanced individual. And Paul connects this self-control, this idea of self-control, with the message of the gospel in, in Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to 14, as the response each Christian should experience through God's grace. This is for all Christians to experience. This is not just for a certain few special group of Christians who God has given the right temperament to kind of uh, work itself out in self-control. No, no, this is, this is for you, brother and sister, if, you're, if you tend to be an angry person. Uh, this is for you, um, brother and sister, if you tend to be a very a lustful person. This is for you, brother and sister, if you are the type of person who tends to, to snap, to, to get angry, to, to get livid, to get back, to get revenge. This is for you. This is for all of us, because God intends, through His grace, to cause a new people to be born, a people that will exhibit self-control. There are two primary views on self-control. This is not in your outlines, but this is important, because Paul is writing to the Cretans, to a group of Cretans in the book of Titus, and he's, he's trying to navigate between these two schools of philosophy, these two, sco- two schools of thought. On the one hand, you've got the Stoics. And we often refer to Stoics as people who are unemotional or people who just don't have any, any type of, of joy about them. They're just kind of, uh, you know, angry all the time or, or just unemotional. They're just a wall, you know. So that's how we tend to define it. But the ancient Stoics actually uh, believed that self-control was an important, one of the most important virtues among courage, wisdom, and justice. So self-control is right up there. It's like the thing to be. And self-control is achieved by looking to yourself, namely to your reason, to your logic, to your ability to think rightly about the world, and not necessarily to the gods. So, uh, you know, Paul's writing to a group of people who, who didn't really value the gods in the way that we would value the gods, say, today, or, or God today where we see God as intervening and interacting with us. Well, the the Greeks really didn't think that. They thought more of, let's appease the gods. Let's just make them happy. So they weren't going to help you be a self-controlled person. Why? Because Greek gods are not self-controlled themselves. I mean, they're not. Remember, you know, in the video that we saw, he called him Zeus the seducer. I mean, Zeus himself, the, the... highest being in the realm of gods has no self-control. And so they're not going to help you with self-control the way our God, the God of the Bible, will help with self-control. And so he's navigating between this, this view, the Stoics view, that self-control is achieved by looking to yourself, looking to your, your own reason, your own logic, your own mind. And since, since reason is the ultimate goal of highest virtue, it's, it's the way to a, attain the highest a sort of enlightenment in this, in this philosophy, uh, Paul addresses this philosophy head on in Colossians chapter 2, verse 20 to 23. You see this, it's very clear. And Paul says this philosophy, saying no to things by sheer willpower, is not effective because your human indulgence is too powerful. Your, ability, your, your desire, your wants, your, your passion is way too powerful to be overcome by reason and logic. It really is. Have you ever tried to explain to yourself and reason with yourself to stay awake? What happens? The faster you reason, the faster you fall asleep. I mean, the more you reason, the the more energy you exert in thinking about something, the more you fall into your indulgence. And so Paul says this is not gonna be an effective way you know, just seem, simply saying, do not touch, do not taste, do not drink. That's not going to work. So on the one hand, you've got the Stoics who believe that being authentic, being an authentic person, being a real person means having morals that are not attached 
to a higher being, but they're attached to your own reason, your own thinking about life in, in, in general. Now, on the other hand, you got the Stokes here. On the other hand, you've got the Epicureans, and they believe that being authentic means to not have morals at all, just let loose, have no control, and everything, all the virtues, justice, wisdom, self-control, and courage, all of those should be tailored to meet your highest pleasure. That's what this, this philosophy is about, high pleasure. Where do you get pleasure? Your pleasure seeker, just go find it, just, just be satisfied. Now, these folks just throw the baby out with the bathwater, don't they? They just say, self-control really is impossible. Let's just enjoy life. Paul summed this uh, philosophy of life up really well where he says in 1 Corinthians 15, if the dead are not raised, in other words, if there are no moral implications for your life, right, because the resurrection of Jesus Christ means that you've got to listen to what he says. Everything up to the point to the resurrection means that Jesus, what he said was true. So you've got to listen to what he says. But if it's not true, then you've got to listen to what he says and forget what Jesus said. And if it's not true, let us eat and drink and be merry. You know, let's pack up. Let's just go to the beach. I mean, wouldn't you rather just be at the beach today if the resurrection weren't true? Well, I certainly would. But the resurrection is true. So it has moral implications. Well, Paul is attacking this view, and he's saying, look, the resurrection happened. There's moral implications, so you can't just say, forget morals, forget, forget self-control. Let's just live it up. Now, self-control in a Christian's life assumes something about human nature. It assumes something about our human nature, right? It's in the words itself, right? Self-control. There's a divided self. There's, there's a self within you that is divided, and that needs to be controlled. The heart, the heart and, and as a result, operates at several different levels. And in the first level, we see the, the level of affections or emotions. Uh, what about the level of making choices, volition, uh, choosing to do what's right, choosing to do what's wrong? What about the level of thought, those three levels, uh, emotions, decisions, and thought? And, and a heart operates at those levels whether or not you have self-control. Remember the train diagram that we saw putting, putting thought thinking, facts before emotions, feelings. Well, now we're, we're beginning to see that self-control is actually pretty all-encompassing in the Christian life, isn't it? I mean, without self-control, your thoughts can go loose and crazy, your emotions can go crazy, and your decision-making can go crazy. Let me just illustrate this in a very, very clear way, and this, by the way, happens throughout all the Psalms. The Psalms is the best place to, to sort of meditate on what self-control looks like. And I just want to read to you Psalm 42, just the first couple of verses of it. Now, pay attention closely, and if you have a Bible turned there, it's not in your outline, but listen to Psalm 42. I want, I want to show you just how complex self-control is and how it really can help. So look at, listen to what the Psalm says. As a deer pants for flowing streams... So pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Doesn't it sound righteous, right? Doesn't it sound holy that he's desiring God? I mean, have you ever thought this way? I just love God so much. I just so unsatisfied. I want to be, I I'm not going to rest until I'm satisfied with it. But now look at this, verse 3 in, in Psalm 42, verse 3. What in the world happens Listen to this. My tears have been my food day and night. Why they say to me all the day long, where is your God? What in the world is happening? I mean, he goes from this declaration of, man, I'm like a deer. I naturally need God, just like a deer needs, needs water. And then he goes in verse three, he changes his mind. He's like, oh, no, no, I've been crying all night, actually. That's what I've been eating, my tears. And I'm just upset because they're asking me, where's your God? Who's, what are you upset about? You see how irrational it got so quickly in just like a matter of one verse? And then in verse four, he recalls to mind, listen to this, these things I remember as I pour out my soul. Again, that desperation. How I would go with the throng, with God's people, 
and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude, a multitude keeping festival. And now God's people have forsaken God and, and they're saying, where's your God? You see, his thinking is just so warped here. I mean, you're, you're just kind of, how can I keep up with this guy? And then again, you get to verse five and look at what, it, well, look at what happens. He's not only thinking about things and he's not only acting irrationally, but now he's talking to himself. Oh boy, here we go, verse five. Look what he says. Why are you downcast, my soul? And why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Now what he's doing there is he's catching himself very quickly, you see there. In verse one he starts with this great proclamation, with this great affirmation about God's satisfaction and then he quickly goes to irrational thoughts, and then he catches himself, and in verse five he says, wait a minute, why am I downcast? God hasn't forsaken me, his people may have, but that just means I can worship God again. There's God's people everywhere. And then you see, you begin to see how he unpacks this psalm, and you, and you begin to realize that his emotions, his decision making, his thinking about life, it's kind of all mixed up. It's all jumbled together. I mean, just in five verses, we've already talked about the three aspects, the three levels of the human heart. And how does he address it? How does he, how does he gain control of his emotions, his thoughts, his decision-making? Look what he says. He says, wait a minute. Hold up. Let's think about this. Soul, you're not hoping in God. Soul, don't you realize, he's talking to himself, he's saying, don't you realize that we can praise God again? Why are you so sad? Relax. And then he says, God is my salvation. He's my God. And so what does he use to control his emotions and his thoughts, his decisions? The hope of God. The hope that he can worship God again. So we can't suppress our emotions we can't suppress our emotions within ourselves. We can't. Our anger, our sadness, our joy, those are all real desires. Those are all real passions. Those are all real emotions. And so in the long run, we can't do that with mere logic and reason because our reason and our logic is faulty. And sometimes we don't even know what's wrong. Have you ever done that before? You come home from work or, and you're sitting there and you're just so upset. And then your wife or your husband comes to you and says, honey, what's wrong? I don't know. I don't know what's wrong. Something's wrong, I just don't know what. Or, or maybe you've just, you know, you've been so, so upset, you just get to the office or something or you get, you know, pick up your kids from school and you're just so upset because time is running down and you know you're like, man, it's so unreasonable for me to feel this way, to be angry, I'm gonna punish my kids. They're not gonna get ice cream now because I'm mad. And they're not going to, you know, forget about it. Forget all of the, forget the rest of the week. They're not getting anything. And, you know, you're mad because of some guy off 95 cut, I, you know, cut you off. And you're taking it on your kids. I mean, have you, has that ever happened to you? You see there a tension. It's a tension within the self. That you cannot control your emotions with just reasonable thinking. It's not possible. And so we have we have a big problem here, and the Stoics are not going to help us. And you know who else is going to help us? The Epicureans. Those who say, you know what? You just got to live life to the fullest. Life is short. You only live once. YOLO. Or, you know, buy one, no, no buy one, get one free is different. YOLO is, is a theme that we hear in our culture today. You only live once. Just live it up, you know. Forget about self-control. Throw the baby out with the bathwater. You can't control your emotions, your thinking, your decision making by appealing to some higher pleasure. It's not gonna work. You're never gonna be satisfied. You're always gonna want the next thing. You know how like when you go to Disney once and what do your kids say when you get in the car? When can we go again? I thought this was enough. I thought one time. Lo, I have set my child upon a trajectory of doom because they will go to Disney for the rest of their life and they will never be satisfied. 
And so this is, the, this is what we're dealing with. This is the, the fickleness of the human heart. And so right smack in the middle of these two views that we see in culture today very prominently, right smack in the middle is the Christian view of self-control, which is so intrinsically connected to the gospel. By intrinsic, I just mean it's, it flows out of the gospel. It really does. It's a response to the gospel. It's so connected to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, who is Jesus Christ for us Christians? He is ultimate reason and logic. He's called the logos, the word, the reason, the logic. And who is Jesus for us? The ultimate pleasure. You see how Jesus combines both views into himself? He says, no, no, you want to, self, you want, you want to get self-control? You're not going to get it unless you come to me. You want ultimate satisfaction and pleasure? You're not going to get it unless you come to me. Everything will be a disappointment. But when you come to me, I give the satisfaction and the pleasure that you're looking for. And so both, both of those things are true in Jesus Christ. And so how do you get self-control? Coming to Jesus Christ in faith, saying, I've sinned. I have fallen short of God's command for me to be self-controlled. And the only way I can be self-controlled is by looking to God through Jesus Christ and saying, God, you understand my heart. Nobody knows me like you do. Nobody has the reason and the logic to change my emotions the way you do. And you also come to Jesus Christ saying, and Lord Jesus, my emotions, my desires, my decisions, my thoughts, nobody holds them captive like you do. Nobody helps me overcome it like you do. Overcome sadness and anger and bitterness with higher pleasure like you do. You are the highest pleasure. And so when I seek you, all those things melt away. This, that's what the psalmist is doing. In Psalm 42, he's saying, I need to look at the highest possible pleasure and the highest possible source of truth, and that is God himself. And so you're not going to find it if you, you skip that. You're not going to find it if you skip Jesus and don't consider him. And so the need for self-control in, Christian, in Christianity means there, there are desires we should not satisfy. There are desires in your heart that you should not satisfy, but that instead you should control. And ultimately, self-control is not about you. The Stoics said you gotta look inside of you to be, to be you. You gotta, look, you gotta find yourself to find you. The Epicurean said you gotta find pleasure to find you. You know what the Bible says? You've got to deny yourself to find yourself. Jesus says, you, nobody can follow me unless they deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. So self-control is not about you. It's about forgetting about yourself. It's about thinking of others highly than yourself, more highly than yourself. It's about thinking about Jesus Christ and the supreme joy that comes with worshiping him. So let me give you two definitions. One is super short, and one is longer and more packed. The super short one is from Tim Keller, and Tim Keller says, defines self-control as the ability to choose the important thing, namely love of God and neighbor, over the urgent thing, namely pleasing yourself. The ability to choose the important thing over the urgent thing. The ability to choose, I'm going to love God and love others more than myself today. That's where self-control comes from. And that's the short definition. But I love definitions, so I need to give you another one because this is more packed, it gives you more handlebars, and I want you to see, uh, this is a summary of Ed Welch, and he says that self-control is a gift, is a gift from the Holy Spirit that causes us to live in protective strategic boundaries. Just circle that part. You know, circle that part of the sentence. To live in strategic, protective strategic boundaries and helps us passionately pursue and rightly think of the fight against sinful lusts. Maybe circle that part too. That's part two. Part three, in the power of the Holy Spirit. Part four, through faith in Jesus Christ. So there it is. That's what self-control is. Self-control is a gift from the Holy Spirit that causes us to live in protective strategic boundaries 
and helps us passionately pursue and rightly think of the fight against sinful lusts in the power of the Holy Spirit through faith in Jesus Christ. So the gospel is what empowers self-control. So in what follows, I want to just briefly give you some directives that flow out of the gospel, and I hope these are practical, I hope these are helpful for you. And it'll look kind of like I'm yelling, but I'm not because there's exclamation points, but I'm just excited because these are important for us to just cling on to and run with. And this, these are directives straight from the gospel. And these are for young men in particular, but can be used by all. So these are ways for young men to cultivate self-control. And so I'm speaking directly to, self, to young men now. It's 60 and under, by the way. Um, and by the way, you can use this list to help disciple another young man in the church. You can look at this, this list as, as a resource for you to, to walk along some, somebody in the church. Women can use this for younger women as well. The first way to cultivate self-control is to resolve to know and cherish God indefinitely. Find joy. Let your life quest be, I have not found joy and I'm going to seek it until the day I die. Or I have found joy, but it's not enough, I need more. Say with the Apostle Paul, for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, that I, and I count them as roughish, in order that I may gain Christ, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Do not be content with your Christian life until you have said that, repeatedly to yourself. Each morning you wake up, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Let that be the mantra of your life. You need to find joy. Do it. Number two, resolve to find every occasion to work diligently. Resolve to find every occasion to work diligently. Avoid laziness. Proverbs 6, 6 to 10 is instructive for us. And really, it's a phenomenon that occurs everywhere in South Florida. So every time you see an ant from now on, you need to be remembered, reminded. Avoid laziness. Proverbs 6, go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come upon you like a robber and want like an armed man. Now, every time you see ants, you're going to be like, oh, I got to work, okay, got to remember. It's crawling around, right? Probably, there's probably one crawling on you right now. And you got to remember, every time you see it, avoid laziness. Look to the ant. It's hard working. Young men, resolve to find every occasion to work diligently. Avoid laziness. Number three, resolve to cut off every sin or opportunity for sin. Be radical. Be radical. In the Screwtape letter, C.S. Lewis writes a series of letters from Screwtape to Wormwood, and both of these uh, characters are demons. They are they're demons, and the enemy in the book, capital E-N-E-M-Y, is God. So, you know, these demons are writing, and they're trying to, to get a young man to be derailed from his faith, and this young man became a Christian, so now he's part of the enemy's team. And so, listen to what Screwtape says to Wormwood. Listen to his letter. It does not matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into the nothing. Murder is no better than cards, if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is the gradual one. The gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. Resolve to cut off every sin or opportunity for sin. Be radical. Number four, resolve to think deeply and meditate on the word of God. Pray. Pray. Now, why do I connect that with thinking deeply and meditating on the word of God? Because often in the scriptures you see the psalmists, people who wrote the book of Psalms, are meditating on scripture. That's all they're doing, really. They're looking at the scriptures from of old and they're saying, 
This is who God is, and this is how we're going to be. Oftentimes, our prayers, and we can look at the Lord's prayer here, oftentimes our prayers reveal our heart, don't they? Your longings, your, your, what has occupied your mind, your desires, your care for others. Prayer reveals so much about you. Now, how do you want to be shaped in your prayers? How do you want to be shaped? Do you want to be shaped by repeating mantras and nothings to God? Or do you want to be shaped by what God has told you to pray? And so, meditating on God's Word helps us learn God's Word. It, it helps us chew God's Word. It helps us have this process where we are now experiencing God afresh. Our prayers should be getting better as Christians. And they should be getting better because we're in God's word. The reason why our prayers are probably not getting better is because we're not meditating on God's word. And so brothers and sisters, I commend God's word to you. Read it, pray through it. Pray through the Psalms. Pray through the book of Titus. You know, an example would be, God, your grace has appeared. It brings salvation for all people. So save my family. It trains us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. But Lord, I get so angry. Train me to renounce ungodliness. You see, we're letting the word shape our prayers. And so brothers and sisters, I encourage you to pray God's word, to pray and to understand God's word better. Number five, resolve to meet the needs of others instead of your own. And so I I just want to commend the young men in this church who serve. Uh, Justin's in the back right there. He is operating the camera today. Um, We've got young men in the sound booth. We've got got young men who are volunteering with children. We We have young men who help all around. And brothers and sisters, I would encourage them, go to these young men after church and say, praise God for your faithfulness. And I would encourage the rest of you, young men, I would encourage you to take up a ministry in the church. Take it up, grab it like a bull by the horns, and never let go. Just stick to it. Just be there. You know, uh, I, I don't know who said this, um, but you know, 80% of, of success is just showing up. There's a clear, mark def- a clear marker of a successful person and a successful young man when he shows up to things. Young men, if you don't show up to things, and you've been relied upon, it just proves that you're not successful. It proves more about you than about the ministry. So young men, be encouraged, take heart, but I challenge you, show up, be here, be present, grab it by the horns, just go with it. Maybe you, I mean, maybe you just need somebody in the church right now just to smack you across the head and say, be there, I'll, count, you know, I'll keep you accountable to that. In love, of course, in love. Young men need to be there. And young men who are there are faithful, are encouragement to the body. Isn't that right? Isn't that encouragement to have young men serving the body of Christ? Number six, resolve to not let a day pass until you have looked at Scripture. Read. Read. I know you may not be a reading person, but the only book you should be reading is the Bible. If you are not a reading person, that gives you no excuse to ignore God's word. Being a reading person has nothing to do with character, it has nothing to do with ability, it has everything to do with discipline. Sit down, read one verse at a time. Listen to what Spurgeon says. True Bible readers and Bible searchers never find the Bible wearisome. And I have to agree. They like it least who know it least. And they love it most who read it most. They find it newest who have known it longest. And they find the pasture to be the richest whose souls have been the longest fed upon. So brothers and sisters, take up and read. Take God's word and read it. One verse at a time till the day you die. Read God's word. Number seven, resolve to be... Resolve to befriend only godly and wise people. Be wise. J.C. Ryle, in his little book, Thoughts for Young Men, it's in our bookstore, writes, the devil has few better helps 
in ruining a man's soul than associating with godly compa- godless companions and friends. What do, good, what do bad morals, or what do bad friends do? Corrupt what? Good morals. And so, brothers and sisters, make friends with godly and wise people. We're not talking about acquaintance, acquaintances here. We're talking about people who you pour out your soul to, people who you can go and be accountable to, people who will, listen to this, give their life for you. The world will forsake you before Jesus does and before his people do. Make for your friends godly and wise people. And he goes on to say, I don't think a young man should have any friends who do not benefit his soul. But that's selfish. You know, it, shouldn't you just be friends with everybody and love everybody? What does the proverb say? Flee, flee the adulteress. Flee the woman who promises pleasure, but who never delivers. Flee the friends who promise satisfaction, but will fail you when time comes. Pursue the friend who will never forsake you. Pursue Jesus Christ. Pursue God's people. Number eight, resolve to succeed in everything you do. Resolve to succeed in everything you do. Accomplish. Many, of young, many a young men have gone out to pursue something and have faced adversity, and at the first sign of adversity, they say, it's too hard. I can't do it. Young men have the resilience, the strength, the ability, generally, to pursue something and accomplish it. Listen to what Spurgeon says, and I'm going to read this whole quote to you. I know we, we're kind of running out of time, but I want this to, to impress you, and I want it to impress you so that you never forget this. Spurgeon writes, and he's talking about men who want to be in the ministry. You want to be in the ministry at Sheridan Hills, listen to these words very carefully. One brother I have encountered, one, did I say? I have met ten, twenty, a hundred brethren who have pleaded that they are sure, quite sure, that they were called to the ministry. They were quite certain of it because they had failed in everything else. He goes on to share a story of a young man who came to his office and said to him, Sir, I was put into a lawyer's office, but I never could bear the confinement, and I could not feel at home in studying law. And what did you do then? Why, sir, I was induced to open a grocer's shop. And did you prosper? Well, I do not think, sir, I was ever, I was never, I was ever meant for trade. And the Lord seemed quite to shut up my way there, for I failed and I was in great difficulties. My general response, Spurgeon writes, is, yes, I see. You have failed in everything else, and therefore you think the Lord has especially endowed you to his service. But I fear you have forgotten that the ministry needs the very best of men and not those who cannot do anything else. A man who would succeed as a preacher would probably do right well either as a grocer or a lawyer or anything else. Now, whether the merits of what Spurgeon says is true, the point is made clear, isn't it? That just because you have failed at everything else does not mean that you're fit for ministry. Brothers and sisters, Sheridan Hills, find men who are qualified to be pastors at this church. Find men who will succeed at anything they do. And we're talking about failures here. We're not talking about, okay, what do you do when you fail? Failure is natural in life, and it comes to all of us. If you've never failed, you're about to. If you have failed, you've learned, hopefully. And so, we're not talking about failure here. We're talking about, have I set out to do something and accomplish it? Is that my goal, to accomplish something? And I can assure you that, that this is who we are as a church. This is who we ought to be as a church. We should have young men in this church who every time they set out to do something, will accomplish it for God's glory. Older men, that's what you should be expecting of younger men in this church. Older women, younger women, younger women, please do not marry men who are, who are not successful in things that they set out to do for God. Run like the plague, saving you much misery. Flee from those men who cannot succeed. Men who accomplish 
men who do things for God's glory and who have the heart to do it will be a blessing to the church. So brothers and sisters, let's pursue those kinds of men. Resolve, number nine, to be part of a church family for as long as you live, for as long as you live. Don't go through phases, don't go through ups and downs, don't go through, oh, you know, I'm rededicating my life. Don't go through any of that. Resolve now to save yourself the headache in 20 years of having to come back into the church. If you don't believe me, just look at brothers and sisters who are older than you in this church who say, I should have stayed in the church when I first was in the church. Stay in the church as long as you live. Commit. Commit to a church. Now, August 19th is just right right around the corner. This is a great announcement for Starting Point. Starting Point is right around the corner. If you have not become a member in this church, you ought to become a member of the church. I've been so encouraged by young men in our college ministry who have become members of the church. They've looked at it and they've said, I need to become a member of the church. May God continue to use young men in our church and continue to grow them and develop them so that they stay here for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Do you know there are brothers in this church who came here as young men and are here as old men today in their late 70s, still active in the church? I want to be like that. I want to look to those men. Young men, look to those men. And finally, and as I've said all these, I'm saying them to myself. I'm a young man who needs desperately God's grace. And so all of these are directives for me that I need to follow, and especially this last one. Resolve to pursue holiness with all your might. Be holy. Young men, be holy. Just final illustration here. Paul Paul exhibits self-control in Acts chapter 23. He's struck by a high priest. The high priest orders that Paul be struck. Paul is going on trial. And this high priest says, I want you to, to strike Paul. He's, he's blaspheming. He's just speaking nonsense. So Paul gets struck by the soldier, and what does Paul say to the guy? He says, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. He says that to the high priest not knowing it was the high priest. And now people heard this and said to Paul, he's like, they're like, do you realize you just cursed the high priest? And Paul, in an act of immediate self-control, recites Exodus 22, 28 from memory. Do you know what Exodus 22, 28 says? Have you memorized this? Are you ready to respond to somebody when somebody strikes you? Do you know what Exodus 22, 28 says? I didn't either, so I looked it up. You know what it says? You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Is that self-control or what? When was the last time you sinned that you called to mind Scripture and it immediately calmed you down? You see this, Paul's rage comes out, immediately cut off by God's word. Oh, I'm guilty of breaking Exodus twenty two twenty eight. You shall not speak evil of one of the rulers of the people. How do you reign in your anger? How do you have control through holiness? Don't study God's law less just because you are not subject to it. Study it more because God's law will make you holy. Don't Avoid God's law. Don't avoid the Old Testament just because we're under the law of grace. We're under the law of Christ. Read it more because we need to learn what it means to be holy. So brothers and sisters, next time you sin, exhibit self-control. Be like Paul. Quote scripture. So let's go and do likewise. Amen.